It's a train wreck. It's a train wreck. But maybe they can turn it around. Hello, welcome back to the recap. My name is Angie and this is Tim. We are not recapping from anywhere this week. Usually we film in Tim's office, which is on the second story and- It's really hot in there and it's making the camera- Overheat and not save anything to the SD card. So this is the compromise. Mm -hmm. It is that time of the year where it's getting hotter and hotter. Mm -hmm. It's usually called summer. <laughs> For our announcements, sorry there's no animation this week. I'm still working on it. The lip syncing is taking a bit longer. And I think that actually works best for me because it is a Mirafield short. And lo and behold, they weren't in this episode this week. Yeah, they've been carrying the show this far, so it's interesting that they're not in this one. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the recap. Seeking Sister Wife, Season 5, Episode 11, Seeking a Connection. These titles are getting kind of tortured, aren't they? They're definitely redundant, because the last week was Seeking a Deeper Understanding, which is basically a synonym of this title. Yeah, they're just cracking open the thesaurus and listing all of the words. So let's start off with the Davis family, specifically Nick. We start off in Aurora, Colorado. Nick and Jasmine pull up in a black Subaru. Mm -hmm. She is wearing another fancy dress with matching black pumps. Yep. This makes it so she's now taller than Nick. I was trying to figure out how tall Nick is based on walking through doors. Not sure. That was just where my mind was. He is wearing a black suit with a silky chartreuse dress shirt. With matching handkerchief. Uh, handkerchief yeah. I thought that one of his wives picked out this dress shirt because they were thinking, well, Jasmine wore a chartreuse dress during our date and she has yellow green nails. Maybe that's her favorite color. Maybe. That's kind of, I don't want to say smart, but attention to detail, I guess. Mm -hmm. Nick is captivated by Jasmine's looks. Mm -hmm. He describes her as someone who is even prettier than he is. That's a complicated compliment because it's dependent on how pretty you think Nick is, which may or may not be saying something. Because it could either refer to the fact that he thinks they both dress fancy, or as he said, he thinks that he's hot. So the fact that he's saying she's more attractive than him means that he thinks she's really hot. You don't think that you could get four women simultaneously if you didn't think you were hot. Mm-hmm. Their first date consists of riding around in a horse-drawn carriage. Jasmine thinks Nick is attractive as well, so much to the point that she is comfortable gazing at him for extended periods of time. Which I think in the last episode she said that she has issues with repetition, which to me is a red flag when dating someone because marriage is all about repetition. Yeah, it's the same person every day. Mm -hmm. It's mundane. You're going to have to wake up to the same person or people every day. My prediction is even if she does become a sister wife, she might get bored of their dynamic. I mean, if she's bored of this dynamic, then how would she react to a normal dynamic? Mm, probably not well. Jasmine says her biggest obstacle to living the polygamist lifestyle is acclimation, since she has not dated more than one person at a time. I mean, like most people. She usually ends up in monogamous relationships. Just like most people. Nick then explains some of their spiritual beliefs to Jasmine. It is entirely based on mathematics and science. Okay. He likens it to an ideology where they keep their feet on the ground. Jasmine concurs with this perspective and continues being her usually agreeable self, listing all the things science has done for humanity. Viruses, plants, bacteria, animals. Now that you mention it, 
She does go on a little bit too long, and it does come off a bit sycophantic. Because she is trying to be very agreeable, which I typically associate those kinds of personalities with. I know I'm going to offend some people out there with a sociopath because they're just trying to say whatever it is to get in your good graces. Yeah, like they've got an ulterior motive. She wants Nick to like her, but she doesn't even know if she likes Nick yet. Why does she want him to like her? Oh, Again, to provide a stable environment for her son. This whole family thing is so fraught. A reason Jasmine is comfortable with this more rational ethos is because she herself was raised in an eclectic manner. In fact, her mother was a reverend who introduced her children to eight different belief systems. Hmm. Jasmine mentions paganism as one of them. She labels herself as an otherworldly being who isn't entirely grounded on Earth. Yes, which Angie and I are familiar with a number of people like this, so it's not that strange to us. But Nick, on the other hand, doesn't take it nearly as well. He was confused that there were even eight different belief systems. <laughs> He's like, "What? It's normal for a man to have eight women, but eight different beliefs in the entire world? That's too many." Or maybe I'm reading that wrong. Maybe he was just surprised. It was strange. He's thinking, "Well, my belief system of rational ethos is normal. What you have got going on is an aberration." I'm joking, obviously, because he does claim to not have an issue with who she worships, which, by the way, are the goddesses Kuan Yin from Buddhism and Oshun from the West African ideology of Yoruba. It's interesting that he's so perplexed by the idea that she is non-standard. That's like the pot calling the kettle black. Yes, or in this case, that is like the polygamist commune leader calling the slightly different belief style person. She's crazy. It's interesting to see Nick kind of flounder a bit. Mm-hmm. We will see more of that. Jasmine hopes to grow more like her goddesses in the future. Nick wasn't expecting this type of information. He claims that he has no problems with her faith, but just wished his wives gave him the heads up of what he was in store for. Again, the fact that she's even here at all does mean that she is unique and weird, just like you guys. <laughs> It kind of feels he's upset with the women on this. Oh, you should have warned me. Jasmine reveals something strange, where she says she a lot of the times asphyxiates when she eats. So she needs to chew faster. You mean slower?、Uh, slower, yes,、yeah, slower. That is exactly what Nick tells her. He is alarmed by this piece of information and goes, "Chew your food. Slow down." <laughs> she laughs this advice off, saying, "Nobody got time for that." Awkward. That's just what it is. Did she think she was going to come off as quirky? Or I guess maybe she's just trying to portray herself as someone who's such a busybody, someone who just doesn't have time to be at the house because she's just so busy outside the home. I don't know. It's hard to believe that she's thinking that far ahead. They kiss, and then Nick kisses her on the shoulder. By the way, it's already dark by now. They stepped into the carriage when it was still daylight, so this must have been a pretty lengthy carriage ride. They certainly got their money's worth from this excursion. I wonder how much of this stuff is comped by the show. I hope it is, because if it wasn't for the show, it would just be his three wives paying for all the dates that Nick is going to be on. Oh yeah, yes. They pay for everything else.、So. I was. Thinking the whole show, not specifically the Davises. Anyway, overall, Jasmine has a good impression of Nick since he is someone who is quote flaunty without flaunting. The carriage ride ends. Nick relays that the night is still young. They should find a nice spot to talk more in depth. Mm -hmm. So they found a conveniently empty and perfect for filming location. The Infinite Monkey Theorem, an urban winery. 
They sit inside the establishment and partake in a glass of wine. At least for Nick. I、Nick think, does. I think that Jasmine drank water. Yeah, good, smart move. But it did show him driving. It stresses Angie out. Also, Angie's a lot of fun when she's drinking. <laughs> They show Jasmine's Death Eater tattoo from Harry Potter. I'm not sure what the implication for that is. Maybe that she likes the color green, or in this case, yellow green. It's one thing to say I'm Slytherin because I'm kind of a jack, <laughs> but it's another to say, "Ooh, I like the aesthetic of those murderous magic supremacists." It's a look. Yeah, it's a, I guess, of our generation because Harry Potter was huge growing yes, up. Yes, very big. Nick says he is interested in all facets of her, the intellectual and the physical. He goes. I don't want your body if I can't have access to your mind. Yes, I want to study your brain and your psychology. Jasmine says you won't have access to my body before accessing my mind. Keep that in mind. This throws Nick off, but he tries to laugh it off. I'm glad there will be no conflicts in that area. I like to pace myself because the sex I give my woman is out of this universe. He doesn't say that. No, it's worse. He tells her his sex is a powerful thing. I've been thinking this since the beginning of the show, and then he says it. What force in the universe could possibly compel three, maybe four women to serve this man who does nothing? And the only conclusion I could come to is that his sex is a powerful thing. And then he says it. It was crazy. That's what it was. Nick implies that Jasmine will be so mind blown by his sexual performance it might distract her from knowing what she really wants out of their relationship. He's concerned that if he exposes her. To the raw sexual power that he possesses prematurely, that it will prevent her from thinking clearly enough, because she will be compelled to obtain more of it. And just when you think things can't be weirder and just effed up with this whole little commune, are there any women out there who would agree to being? A sister wife and taking care of this man in exchange for really, really mind blowing sex. I don't know. I don't know how good his sex is. It's a powerful thing. <laughs> oh gosh. The date continues, and Jasmine verbalizes how awesome Nick's three wives are. The very confident man then takes this as his cue to invite her to their house over the weekend. She emphasizes how slow she is when forming connections, and she would like Nick. To respect that, upon hearing this, he makes a befuddled expression. It turns out he doesn't respect that, but he's willing to put up with it. He says it's okay, and I'm thinking, okay, that's to be expected to go slow. Yeah, he says that's fine. No, it's not fine. That's to be expected. That's what you want. You want them to be slow. Slow means that they know what they're doing. Slow works better for everyone. Why would you be upset if it was slow? Yeah, it means you're not barreling into a situation. You're being considerate. You're being thoughtful about things, which you're a fan of, Nick. Apparently. <laughs> In his confessional, he claims to not have a problem with Jasmine setting her own schedule. Again, that's her schedule to set. You shouldn't have an opinion on it. He asserts that he loves a fiercely independent woman because that gives him more time to be thinking. Does he though? I don't know, because again, from last episode, we postulated that Nick isn't even capable of making some sort of pros and cons list to assess whether doing this will make Danielle leave, and he is totally unfazed by that possibility. His main concern is the disharmony Jasmine's presence may cause in his household. Yeah, you should have thought about that earlier. Their date ends. It cuts to Danielle in their living room, waiting for Nick to walk through their front door. She has lonely puppy energy. 
To be clear, I do not believe that she was actually staying up and watching TV. I think the entire thing was staged. Yeah, she still had her makeup on. There's no way in reality that that's what was happening. That's, again, just the show trying to create something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Danielle tells Nick she couldn't sleep and was curious as to how his date went. Nick says it went very well. Jasmine is very beautiful, who isn't afraid to make some off-the-wall comments. Danielle asks if there was any kissing involved. Nick confirms that assumption. In his confessional, he explains the reason he was hesitant in giving an answer. It was because he knows how fearful Danielle is concerning more wives being added into the family. It's awkward whenever I see Danielle and Nick interacting because she is so much younger and it is not balanced. And it's disturbing to me. I think everyone who's watching this is a little bit disturbed by the Davises dynamic, aside from the age gap. As we postulated in another recap, the women might be in this situation because they might have daddy issues. So the fact that Nick is somewhat of a paternal figure is appealing to them. Okay, that makes sense. The producer then asked Danielle what she thinks of this piece of information. The kissing bit. Mm -hmm. She isn't okay with it. She wishes she would get over her anxieties, but she just can't. By the way, I think she did try to say that she was okay with it, but her face was saying something else. Nick then asked her the big question, which is, are you okay with Jasmine staying the night? The, the answer's no. The 24-year-old, of course, lies to us, saying that that is okay. She is good with Jasmine having a sleepover with them. Sleepover. Again, that weird dynamic. Once again, Danielle admits to lying about her own feelings and that she only says the things people want to hear. Nick tries to assuage her fears, saying, while well, Danielle isn't the sole decision maker of their family, he does put a lot of weight on what her opinions are. Which I don't think he does. Because I don't know if it's the fact that none of these people are good at reading people, but all the viewers could pretty much see from season five, episode one, that Danielle was not okay with them bringing in another wife. And the fact that she is in front of them and she's telling all these lies and they don't pick up on that is very disturbing. I think it might be a seeing what you want to see kind of situation, or it is a blatant disregard, either or. I think it's just a blatant disregard because these people be lying where April says, you mean more to me than bringing in someone into the family, which spoiler alert, I don't know if I mentioned this before, in a recent dating post in an app, it did show Jennifer and April saying that they want to look for new sister wives with Danielle not in the mix. She wasn't in their profile. So it's clear that Danielle left, and obviously she wasn't as important to them as the prospect of adding more women. Hmm. My opinion of the Davises has plummeted substantially since the beginning of the season. Yeah. They end on a humorous note where Nick says if Danielle is having some trouble sleeping, he can help her with that by taking her upstairs to the boom boom room so that she can get tired out. I don't know where to even begin on that. It is an unfortunate combination of words. I think Nick said knocked out, not tired out. I just tried to make it sound better. It's worse. <laughs> So, let's stop talking about these people. Please. I think last week we said that the Davises were the only successful polygamist family. In quotation, successful. In my mind, I was also going to say the Sherwoods are also somewhat successful, but I take that back as we will see in their segment. We are back with Ashley and Shane in the middle of their filming a couch confessional where they're being asked about Sarah. Ashley receives a call in the middle of it, from none other than, gasp, their girlfriend. The 28-year-old asks if she can meet them somewhere nearby to talk. I call BS on this interaction. This feels producer-constructed nonsense. I agree because it did seem fake, 
Immediately, we get the camera crew filming her inside of her car, and then she says something on her phone, which we can hear her from the inside of her car. That means she is mic'd up. It's too convenient to have the person that you want to film at the time you want to film have a real interaction and have that all together all at once. No, there's no way that this is real. Dramatic music plays in the background as Ashley and Shane make their way toward her. Shane sets up some chairs for them to talk. Basically, Sarah tells the Sherwoods that she has only known them for a month. She was caught off guard when they asked her to be exclusive with them, and when she gave her answer, it was too premature since she wasn't ready. Moreover, Sarah knows that they are people who get attached. Too easily. In order to alleviate their fears, they ask her to be monogamous to them. It goes without saying, Sarah recognizes that and doesn't think that is healthy. Cause it ain't. They wanted to own her. Mm-hmm. Like she was a pet. Yeah. Shane is confused. If that is the case, he asks, "What should they be doing differently?" Does she want to continue pursuing them whilst keeping her options open? Sarah shakes her head. Honestly, no. I'm not going to base a major decision in my life due to someone getting some feeling that they need to do this. The creep factor with you two was way too high. I wish Daniel Merrifield had that same level of thinking, where you don't base major life decisions because someone had a feeling. Sarah goes on to say that her independence is very important to her, and she won't allow others to swoop in and control her. Ashley seems very controlling. The fact that again she's the hub who gets to have all these spokes, we're all thinking, but why are you so special, Ashley? It's her bisexuality. She needs to explore it. But what if another one of these women is also bisexual? <laughs> That just would be unconscionable. <laughs> the Sherwoods go back inside their house to talk Sarah.、Mm -hmm. Lots of expletive deleted. They accuse her of being deceptive, of being someone who gave them false hope and pulled the rug out from under them without warning within twenty-four hours. Shane answers his own rhetorical question of was she trying to mislead them? He says it's a. Person who does that. I thought how Sarah ended things was appropriate because the alternative would be to what ghost them. From Shane and Ashley's perspective, the only appropriate thing that she could do is to marry her. Yes, which still doesn't make any sense because we know that there's not supposed to be a relationship between her and Shane at that point. Why not just find a normal lesbian woman to be with Ashley? Why even make this about sister wives? Also, Shane doesn't have cancer, and their kid has a dumb name. <laughs> we'll get to all of that. I don't want to make fun of a small baby. No, the baby's fine. I'm sure the baby's an upstanding baby citizen. <laughs> I'm talking about them. So the next scene shows Ashley, Shane, Sai, and newborn baby Sway cooking in the kitchen. They give the date when he was born, October seventeen, twenty twenty one. Was it twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two? I don't care. I can't remember. I don't think it matters either way. It might have been twenty twenty two because in the background you can see I think it was their plaque of their wedding date、mm -hmm. that said September twenty twenty one. I'm too lazy to go back and check. Doesn't matter. Despite the new commotion going on within the family, the Sherwoods are still set on getting a new wife slash have Ashley keep exploring her bisexuality. They explain that Shane is in the clear. There have been no new growths. But he is due for another screening in about six months. Which, by the way, as Tim said, Shane made a new Instagram post with a picture saying that he is now cancer-free. So, congratulations, y'all can stop looking for another wife for Ashley. Or your poorly thought-out excuse is no longer valid. Can't remember if it was in their ask me anything. I think they did say that 
the cancer as much as they purport that it was part of their reason to seek a sister wife isn't relevant because before Shane got his diagnosis, they were actively dating women. I guess it doesn't matter if Shane is healthy. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. The only thing healthy in this relationship is Ashley's libido. <laughs> anyway, she is crying because she can't form her sapphic love nest sooner. Yeah, this isn't even about sister wife. It shouldn't be this hard. Mm -hmm. And if you thought that was nothing, we now segue to the Salahuddin's. Yes, fulfilling their contractual obligation to have filmable content. The Salahuddin's just talked to Jahari a little bit. As you said, they return from Garlik after that horrendous lunch date with Jedzilla. Nyla divulges that these types of disputes are extremely common between her and her mother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, I know. The thing that set her off, though, was when their daughter was brought into the conversation, when Nyla knows full well that Jamila doesn't have a bond with her. Nyla says Jamila doesn't even know how to pronounce their daughter's name, which is Haya, not Harriet. Sorry if I mispronounced their daughter's name in the last recap. I was just going with what the subtitles said. Johari asked the ever-looming question of why do they continue to have these kinds of discussions with Jamila if she isn't open to change? Thank you. Naeem answers, saying he still wants to have a relationship with his mom, and in order to ease her into his personal life, he needs to gradually introduce their plans of seeking a sister wife because the alternative would be blindsiding his mother with a new wife. Maybe you should do that? I mean, it's not going to happen, but if the impossible occurs, it'll be easier to get her forgiveness than her permission. <laughs> yes. Obviously, what Naeem has been doing hasn't been working. Johari does bring up the point in the argument where Nyla called her mother-in-law an Johari reminds Nyla that she herself tried her best to dial it back because once someone gets embarrassed, they have no motivation to save face, aka they're going to show they're behind. Yes, they're just going to devolve from there. The very tall woman reiterates that no matter how emotional you get, you always need to retain some level of composure. I like Johari. She's very level-headed and sees how it is. I just don't get why she likes to hang out with these two. Yes, yeah, she likes them for some reason. She lays out some suggestions for future interactions with Jamila. She suggests not having any at all. <laughs> I mean, that's an option. Naeem is hesitant to do that since he wants a potential wife to not feel like an outsider due to other family members, such as his mom, not knowing about them. Just make the mother an outsider. <laughs> if this is really that important to you, eventually you're going to have to prioritize yourself. Again, it's never going to happen, though. Johari reluctantly cuts the visit short, saying she just loves hanging out with Nyla and Naeem so much. They end their segment, saying they hope eventually the mom will come around and respect their decisions. That's up there with world peace. <laughs> Ending world hunger. Disarming all nuclear weapons. Uh, it's not going to happen. They will continue courting more women since they believe the end goal is beautiful and nothing worth fighting for never came easy. So a couple that is definitely not having an easy time pursuing polygamy are the Ryans. Oh my gosh. They're so sad. They're so pathetic. I love to watch them fail. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. We are back in Selena, Texas with Justin and Becky. Becky is conversing with her sister-in-law and 22-year-old daughter about what to wear to her first date with Yari. I thought that these were her daughters aged 11 and 14. Yeah, especially the one that was 22. I thought she was in high school at most. <laughs> So that shocked me. Becky is more nervous about meeting Yari since Stephanie actually knew of Becky before they started dating. 
Justin and Becky proceed to drive to a Mexican restaurant where they will meet Yari. Justin doesn't want to enter the restaurant until he knows Yari is there for fear of being stood up again. You know, he's such a tough, brave man. He doesn't want to look like a loser. <laughs> I've got bad news for you, friend. You look like a loser. Because he is one. <laughs> The Latina woman actually greets them as they are getting out of their vehicle. Apparently, today also happens to be Yari's birthday. She is turning 42. Becky is not surprised that her husband is attracted to Yari since she meets his two biggest criteria. She goes to the gym regularly and she is Latina. They sit at a table. Justin tries to pull out Yari's chair before she has a chance to sit. He misses his chance, and he laments that he tried to be a double gentleman, but was too slow. Double gentleman? Because I'm assuming he also pulled out Becky's chair. I was going to say, he's aiming for double gentleman, but by my estimation, he hasn't even met half gentleman yet. He's kind of a jerk. What, with his forcing a woman to kiss him? That, him wanting to punch holes in walls for trying to stalk women, pressuring women by signing them up for predatory gym memberships, lots of stuff. Justin has strange ideas of what it means to be an upstanding man. Boy, howdy. They sit in silence, eating their chips and salsa for a few minutes, until Becky breaks the ice. She asks the birthday woman what does she like to do for fun. Yari, of course, responds with information the Ryans already know. She likes to go to the gym. Asked and answered. <laughs> Yari doesn't follow up the conversation with anything else, leaving Becky to grasp for more talking points. You can tell that Yari is exceptionally uncomfortable with this entire thing. Mm -hmm. Because Justin does say that usually she's more flirty and talkative, but obviously because Becky is here... She is uncomfortable. I mean, she didn't sign up for Becky. Because, as Becky said, Yari pretty much skimmed over Justin's profile pictures and description, particularly the bit where he claimed to be seeking a second wife. People don't want to read through a wall of text, especially if it's not their first language. You think that's how it went? Maybe. She just assumed that he wasn't crazy. <laughs> This is why you need to read the fine print. Maybe these dating apps need to have a big old red X symbol that appears over polygamists so people will know before they reach out to them. Because I don't think that was a feature of the dating app they were on. No. Like they said before, they said that they're tired of being on polygamous to dating apps. They're doing what Garrick does. They're trying to cast a wide net and use regular dating apps. And just trick them. <laughs> and yes, Becky is very much trying to be super into this. And Justin is being very withdrawn and quiet and awkward. And Yari is exceptionally awkward. She thought, maybe I could make this work. And then five minutes into it, no, I'm not going to make this work. How can I get out of here as quickly as possible? Becky goes, how was last night's date? Yari just says it was good. I don't know if Yari isn't articulating herself because English probably isn't her first language or just the fact that she's on a date with a man and his wife. There is no training for this. It's new and weird to everyone. Anyways, the waitress brings out their entrees. Becky tries to get a better picture of how their first date went. She asks Yari if they kissed. Yari affirms that, but quickly becomes embarrassed, asking Justin if he was the one who spilled the beans. This is probably why you shouldn't try to find sister wives on a singles dating website. Because people are going to get the wrong impression of you. There is no preparation for this kind of situation. Yari just says that she got embarrassed by that question because she didn't want Becky to feel jealous. Which Becky keeps saying that she's fine. She's fine with that. But alas, this actually upsets Justin. He didn't want his wife to ask about their kiss because it made Yari uncomfortable. 
Again, I found that weird of him to say since he was the one who initiated that. Even though Yari was uncomfortable to yeah. do that on camera. Throughout all of Justin's talking heads, you can tell that he didn't comb his hair before this date happened. Yeah, it doesn't look good. It was sticking up. I think I know what's going on with his hair. What's going on? I think that his hair is thinning and he's come up with this way of addressing it similar to the Cody Brown where he presses his hair down strategically to make it look more full but doesn't want it to look like it's plastered to his head so some of it is coming up. <laughs> That's my best guess. It doesn't look good. Because Becky is always super micromanagey about her husband's hair, as we have seen a couple episodes ago. The conversation takes another strange turn. Becky tries to ask Yari if polygamy is something she is open to. The best Yari can compare this lifestyle to is infidelity, in that many marriages, a spouse has a side piece that their partner never knows about. I mean, yeah. Becky tries to spin that in a positive light, expressing that instead of the wife getting cheated on, she has the benefit of having a best friend and someone they can share their life with. Have we, in all the time that we have been watching these shows about polygamy, ever encountered a single woman who was best friends with their sister wife? At least not while they're married to the husband, because I think Janelle and Christine just became close after they divorced Cody. Um, they all have this shared belief that sister wives equal best friends, but we've yet to see that in the wild. I think they're just idealizing what a sister wife is, because obviously once reality sets in, they start to think, I don't really want to have anything to do with this woman anymore now that she is intimate with my husband. Yeah, for some reason. Yari doesn't have a definite answer if she can be in a polygamist dynamic. She wants time to process all of this. And she certainly wants more time to appreciate all the free lunches that she's getting. <laughs> because as we'll see in the next episode, Yari does say, you're going to prioritize Becky over me, because why should you prioritize me? I'd only want a man to myself. I just think, then why are you even here? Well, she didn't choose to be here. She just showed up here. What do you mean? She did choose to be here. Wait, was that, um... Yari. Yari? Well, Yari didn't want to be in a polygamous relationship. She just wanted this big, strong, fish-lipped man. <laughs> like, this is why you need to read... The profile description, I just thought that information that she didn't even do that just struck me as that she's kind of lazy. I don't know. I don't have any experience with online dating. Becky then lies to us saying that her and Justin are the most patient and considerate people. So take all the time you need to figure this out. What I took from that is that they're extremely desperate. Because obviously they're not patient people. Justin and Becky, who would want to stalk a woman to get immediate answers. They just have no other leads, and they're at the end of their ropes. In the meantime, Yari does agree to continue dating these two losers. Until she inevitably ghosts them off screen. Uh, maybe after a couple more episodes. Well, that is the end of the recap. Nick and Jasmine go out on a date, and he reveals that he is in the possession of quite a powerful... Anaconda. <laughs> <laughs> the Sherwoods get dumped in a completely authentic and in no way contrived production stunt. But this infuriates so, Shane for some reason. The Salahuddins were in this episode. The Ryans find out that their potential sister wife does not see herself as a potential sister wife. Very good. So thank you for making it to the end. Here's Morty, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.